Good afternoon and welcome to Making Health System M&A Work, a complimentary webinar from healthsystemcio.com sponsored by Relay Health. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I'll be your moderator today. We encourage you to ask questions. Uh, you can go ahead and type them in at any time in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and leave the default set to all panelists. I'll be looking at those and posing them later in our program. Now you can download the deck. You have the URL in front of you. Uh, we'll send it out in the chat box, and we also have a shortened URL at the uh, bottom of every slide. So plenty of chances to get the deck. And we will. Uh, we are recording this event. We'll have an archive available within two business days. You'll receive an email when it's ready, and a separate registration is required. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 45 minutes. First, we're going to hear from our good friend Linda Reed, VP and CIO at Atlantic, Atlantic Health System in New Jersey. Then we're going to hear from our sponsor, represented by Lara Smith, Program Director uh, HIE at Relay Health. And then we're going to have our Q&A with Linda. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Linda Reed. Linda, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Appreciate it. So, um, uh, Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to speak to you today um, about this really important topic. Uh, and it's an increasingly frequent tap topic here in New Jersey. Um, the health systems are, are, are most visible in, in this uh, in the M&A world, but at the same time, we're having lots of activity in the physician practice space. Um, if the industry pundits are correct, uh, the U.S. healthcare system is probably slated to look like 200 merged systems um, throughout the country. So, you know, while the the topic here is making this health system M&A work, really, uh, I think the topic could also be it's all about scale. Uh, when you, you know, look at some of the industry information, uh, they talk about the fact that to succeed as a healthcare organization today, you need to be in the two to four billion dollar range. Um, I think that's been revised up, and I think mo some places are actually talking about ten to twenty billion. So that's why I think uh, M and A is just such an important topic today. Uh, just uh, before I get started, uh, the requisite little bit of information about Atlantic Health System. Uh, we are a five, almost six hospital system in uh, northwestern New Jersey in the New York metropolitan area. Um, like I said, five hospitals. Uh, we've grown, we've shrunk, uh, we've grown again by M&A uh, starting in the early 1990s. Uh, we've got about 650 doctors in a multi-specialty group, uh, and that has grown substantially. Uh, we've gone from about 250 about two years ago to the 650 that I just mentioned. Um, so again, while the hospitals are the most visible, the physician practice uh, alignment is really uh, very hot. Um, New Jersey is a very rapidly consolidating healthcare market. Um, it's been identified that probably in the next five to six years, there may only be three to four systems in the entire state. Um, at Atlantic, we also are the proud owners of two MSSP ACOs um, that covering about 125,000 covered lives, and then we've got four to six uh, commercial ACO uh, products, uh, another 125,000, and we just uh, launched our first Medicare Advantage plan. So while today uh, revenues from risk are somewhere at 2%, uh, I think we see them growing into about 20% probably in the next uh, two to five years. Um, so just a little bit about um, Atlantic Health IT. Uh, we are a corporate function. Um, it's a bit of a shock sometimes to our newer members when they join, especially if they've been standalone hospitals, uh, exactly what a corporate function is and how they kind of fit into that puzzle. So if you look at us today, we do have a centralized corporate information services department. Uh, we have a local desktop and move ad changes teams. We also have uh, local physician support teams, one in each hospital. Uh, we have a centralized help desk or customer service center, uh, centralized physician alignment team. Uh, we do uh, those acquisitions and we bring them on board centralized. We have centralized information security, combined policies. Uh, we have a centralized contracting. Um, and then we have centralized IT procurement and asset management. Uh, some of our really big challenges, though, are creating integration today in a best-of-breed type of environment. Um, 
we had our strategy set and we had our EHR plan and direction set and then our vendor um, decided that they were going to change direction in their strategy. That's really uh, made a, a significant impact on our strategic plan in lots of ways, including how we go about bringing on emerged or acquired organizations. It really had to force us to change our approach to that. <clears throat> So at this point in time, we have to assess all of our organizations as they come on, take a look at what they have, and decide whether we're going to <clears throat> leave them on uh, parts of what they've already got in place, um, or are we going to bring them on our temporary enterprise uh, infrastructure. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Atlantic Health has a very long uh, merger and acquisition history. Uh, we've been doing this since about 1996. Early on, uh, there was very little consolidation. When we brought on hospitals, they kind of stayed as a uh, single entity and they operated on their own um, and their IT was on their own. Probably in the last 10 years, that approach was changed and as we started bringing on organizations, uh, we really did move to the enterprise model and started moving everyone to the same systems and same operating policies and, and, uh, and functions. Uh, divesting, we've divested of two, um, and that was also an interesting uh, process because now we've had to figure out what we were going to give back. Uh, how were they going to get it back? Um, did they, did the system licenses belong to the organization or did they belong to the corporate entity? So uh, while acquisition is painful, um, divesting is sometimes just as painful or maybe even a little bit more. Um, based on that, our, our experience has been that each organization is really different. Um, of the three that we've acquired, one was a standalone hospital, um, smaller, and we forklifted out everything that they had. Um, one of the reasons that they had to look at merging uh, a merger or acquisition was that they had gotten uh, behind in their IT, very behind. Um, when they started taking a look at what they were going to need to do for meaningful use, uh, what were they were going to do going forward, the cost to upgrade the IT that they had put in place was so great that they probably couldn't handle it on their own. So they uh, took a look at that and they uh, made some decisions and decided to join with us. Uh, we couldn't even, they were so far behind that we really, there really was no um, saving what they had. So we did do a forklift um, and changed out their entire IT. One of the interesting issues that they had there was that their entire IT department was outsourced. So that just brought in some complexities that uh, we had to work with. Who was going to stay? Will any of them stay? Who was going to go? Our second uh, acquisition, we decided to leave mostly intact. Um, they have uh, a separate HIS system today, and they were in the middle of um, the meaningful use certification. Um, there's quite a bit of money on the line. Uh, we didn't want to put that in jeopardy, so they are sitting there. What we did do with them is that we consolidated from an enterprise perspective all the things that went around them, uh, the HR, dietary, lab, but left the core uh, HIS intact. Our third one is interesting because we're acquiring them from another IDN that's from that's out of state that wants to leave the state of New Jersey. Um, so with that acquisition, we're taking a look at what what can we pull uh, or keep uh, from their enterprise systems, if anything? Um, do we stay on any of their systems for a little while? Do they we let them support us for uh, you know a little bit? Uh, and it really has to do with uh, the approvals as to when the the acquisition is going to finally happen. So again, long history. Every single one's been a little bit different. And what we've learned really is that there is there are two parts um, to mergers and acquisitions. There's uh, the time before the signing, and then of course the time after the signing. So before the signing, it's really interesting. So in New Jersey, we have a process called CHAPA. It's the Community Health Care Assets Protection Act, um, and that requires a whole thing, uh, a whole process of reviews to happen by the Department of Health, by the state attorney uh, attorney's office, and then uh, has to be approved by the Superior Court. 
all of these reviews are set up to determine uh, whether the merger or acquisition is in the best interest of the public here in New Jersey. So they try to ensure um, that the transaction um, really has um, met some very key uh, items. Uh, was the appropriate due diligence done? Um, are the contract terms fair and reasonable? Are there any conflicts of interest? Um, will the charitable purpose of the organization still be there uh, from the original organization? Um, so they review all every transaction to determine whether these um, uh, transactions meet those uh, those keys. So uh, it's especially onerous if the entity is from out of state or moving out of state or is a for-profit because then they really get some extra scrutiny. Um, our latest acquisition is actually caught in that process. Um, the original owner is from out of state. They are they will be taking the purchase price uh, with them out of state when they leave and the state of New Jersey wants to make sure that uh, the public uh, maintains the uh, charitable donations and the funds that were part of that organization ahead of time. So, but before any of that's done, if that isn't done, you can't share a lot of things, especially information that's considered uh, competitive. Um, so, uh, when we take a look at this, we always talk about what you can and can't know. Um, we shouldn't be asking questions, especially other things that we shouldn't be knowing. Um, we have to also pay attention to what we can and can't disclose. Um, we usually can't talk about anything that includes any kind of rates or reimbursements or prices um, because that would be considered uh, anti-competitive. Um, and then we also take a look at the things that we can collect. We can talk about, we can talk about um, who are you as an organization? Uh, what does your department look like? Um, what is your meaningful use status? Where are you with ICD-10? So we can ask some of those kind of questions. Um, early on, we do start talking about our IT portfolios, and we exchange that just so that we have a good idea of how uh, large or small the gap is going to be as we start moving into this. Um, it lets us take a look at how big the, the effort's going to be. Um, the, other in, the other items that we have um, that we take a look at very seriously, we look at um, cybersecurity. We look at, your his, at their histories. We look at their breaches. Um, we look to see, um, we actually ask them to do with, our, with the company, our security company, uh, a security assessment um, so that we know how close they are to our standards. Um, and then we also take a look if there's any kind of uh, longstanding IT outsourcing contracts because I think some of those some of those things you have to know before you go into this so you know whether there's going to be some additional expense that you hadn't anticipated. Um, then I think the, the, the other thing that we look at before with the signing is some agreement of what assets are included. Um, will the PCs be included? Are the time clocks included? Um, are certain licenses included? So those are the conversations that we have ahead of time. After the signing is really when a lot of the, the really the meat of the work starts. Um, that's when you can really start talking about um, the budgets, right? What is your budget? How much have you spent? What's your capital budget? What's your operating budget? Contracts. That's uh, one of the the biggest um, items that, that's always on our list is getting copies of contracts. We have to then take a look at um, are there redundant contracts? Do they have um, Microsoft's always a big one. Um, they have one, we have one, do you have an enterprise, we have an enterprise, um, how long is it? Uh, for the most part, those kind of contracts can't be combined. So, uh, you know, are there contracts that we can eliminate and combine, or is it something that's going to have to run out? Um, how do things work? How does your billing process work? Um, how do you order things? Um, so that's when we start getting into that, and then we bring in our departmental and operations folks to, to do that. We can also then start discussing salaries, uh, pay time off, pensions, hours per week. Um, that's the sourcing information then to the purchasing materials management. Then you can start really looking at the prices and how you're going to build that out. Policies and procedures um, is always another difficult item to do. You pretty much have to walk those things, um, you know, item by item. And uh, in our M&A uh, experience, we've actually taken policies from other organizations that have come in and then had better policies than the ones we've had in place. Um, so, you know, I, 
it's always best to take a look at what you're bringing in and making sure that you can incorporate that. Vendor consolidation plans. Uh, what are we going to do if, you know, we've got two of everything? Um, how long do they stay that way? How are we going to consolidate it? Uh, determining the integration path. And then um, from a staffing perspective, who's staying? Um, is there, are there expectations, are there not? If you're keeping most of their system intact, how many people do you need? Um, so there's just a lot of things there from staffing perspective. Once we get past that, then we really start looking at um, how do you plan? Planning the path for each one of these I think is a little bit different. So while my team looks at the IT, um, it really doesn't, it doesn't hinge on the IT, right? There's just so many other things that are important. Um, so the IT is one aspect, but what services are, are you going to offer? Is the new organization going to continue offering the same services that they did in the past? Will that change? Um, the physicians, uh, how many are there? What are they on today? The program size and quality, uh, when some of the acquisitions come in, um, is their quality the same as the quality of the bigger organization? Are you going to have to do some work there to ensure um, that they do have the same quality um, in the standards? And then from a, a reputation perspective, um, actually some of the acquisitions that we made, um, the reputation in the community for the, uh, the facility that's being acquired, their reputation actually went up in stature. So there's just so many other things that impact um, exactly what you're going to do with the, with the IT. Um, so when we look at some of the decisions from an IT perspective, um, how much do you integrate? Uh, or is it just peripheral pieces? Is it everything? How fast are you going to do it? What's the budget? Um, do they want it done quickly or do, you know, do they want to save some money? Um, and then we take a look at the regulatory projects that are in flight and, uh, and of course, also the status of other in-flight projects that probably have to do uh, something with their prior strategic plans. Um, for us, an important thing to look out for was meaningful use, um, also ICD-10. Um, some of the uh, some of the expense that's been put out for the remediation of systems for those um, those projects is something that hasn't been depreciated yet. So each acquisition, as I mentioned, has been unique in scope and in timing. Um, the diagrams that are on this slide just represent part of our approach as to how we kind of uh, talk to operations about well, how we're going to approach the the change. So you know we do talk about. Um, Pretty much we start with departmental functions uh, and applications. Uh, then we talk about the IT functions, and that includes uh, the network and, and technologies and telephone. And then we go into application detail, uh, exactly, uh, you know, what are we doing with patient accounting? What are we doing with medical records? What are we doing um, with order entry? So we kind of tier it that way. Now, you know, not to make it sound, um, not to be facetious, but in some ways the IT is the easier part. It's a little more concrete. Um, it's the operations decisions that are so difficult, um, especially if you've got an organization that has been a standalone and independent uh, for a long time. Uh, they really have sometimes a hard time identifying who they are in the new organization. So, you know, I think what we have to understand is that form follows function sometimes and there's just things that you have to get done. Um, so who is the new organization? How do they fit into the enterprise? Um, how much of the or old organization will be retained? Um, what operational benefits are expected? The boards, when they uh, approve these deals, they have some very clear goals and expectations. What are they? Um, Will some departmental functions remain local uh, or will they become part of a corporate function like the lab? Um, will some services go away, be added? Uh, and how are you going to do this? Is this a big bang is versus incremental? I think the other thing that we always try to pay attention to is um, how much change can be absorbed by an organization. Um, if we're doing meaningful use and you're doing ICD-10 and you're doing all these other things and now uh, an acquisition comes along, um, it, it's, it, sometimes it is the la uh, one more straw, right? And then I guess it's a, finally is uh, the cost savings because each one of these deals also comes along with a projected cost savings. 
At Atlantic Health, though, we have settled pretty much uh, on a process uh, when we take a look at these mergers uh, or acquisitions. And we start off with um, something we called onboarding functions. And so when we take a look at that, it really is anything that um, the first initial things that we probably have to do to to take over some of the functions of that organization. Um, that includes uh, general financials, a general ledger, um, some of the things so that we can start looking at billing. Uh, we also include some of the business intelligence and start bringing in some data into the reporting. Um, HR payroll, uh, that allows us to create badges, bring the employees on, um, have them in, have their files created. Time and attendance is the other part, and that has to do with time clocks um, and some of the uh, the pay uh, pay rules. And what we have to do there is we usually uh, put in our own time clocks and then run those parallel for a little while. Um, physician credentialing uh, is the other one we do. We try to put all the physicians' uh, credentialing onto the same system, um, and then uh, that way that just comes out of one place. And then we look at network connectivity. Um, that has to be in place to support all of these functions. Um, we have to take a very careful look sometimes as to what it is that we're acquiring from a, a networking perspective, a server perspective, and especially a security perspective. Uh, sometimes we don't provide full network connectivity, especially if, they're, um, if they haven't quite passed uh, a security assessment to our, our uh, uh, our standards, because then it puts uh, the rest of the organization in a little bit uh, of a bind. Uh, we really don't want to take on some of that risk. So at times, you know, we bring some of these, thing these functions on. We'll look at them as a virtual desktop um, or a VPN function, depending on how close or far we are from bringing that network connectivity together. So that's onboarding functions. The second piece that we look at then is revenue cycle um, and some of the pieces that go along with revenue cycle, medical records, and then the third Third thing that we take a look at is the clinicals and other systems. Um, I think that we also take a look at the, you know, what do we have to do? Will some throwaway interfaces have to be incurred if we're phasing it in? Um, if some of the systems are very much the same, um, how easy it is to just put one in over the other? So why do organizations merge? And I think we all can say, you know, or everyone agrees that it is to improve values uh, or value of the organization. Um, so I think when we take a look at this, um, realizing the value comes down to economies of scale, right? It, it's cost savings, it's efficiencies, um, and that's based on finding um, efficiencies with staffing, um, pricing, contract consolidation, data center consolidation um, for us. Um, but it also brings in new skills, uh, new ideas, new capabilities. Um, and it's interesting because I think it's uh, Chilton is one of the hospitals that we brought on, a uh, great hospital, standalone for many, many years. Um, but now how do they consider themselves now that they've gone from Chilton Memorial Hospital to Chilton Medical Center as part of Atlantic Health? Um, it really significantly changes, I think, their own uh, view of themselves and who they are. Um, I think it's really interesting, and I just put it down here. Um, I'm always surprised that sometimes the uh, leadership doesn't really realize that there are expenses that have to be put out um, before some efficiencies are realized. Um, you might have to have some additional costs to integrate the new organization. You might have to bring, you might have to do some upgrades. You might have to do some security improvements. Uh, so uh, I think it's often, you know, a it hinges on the CIO to make sure that that the powers that be are reminded that there might be, you might have to spend to save. Um, so, you know, many integrations, uh, I think for many organizations, integration is considered an IT problem. Um, I think in this organization, we've tried really hard to make sure that there's an awareness that operational fragmentation goes along and can cause IT fragmentation, and that kind of all goes along with the costs. So if you've got problems, you know, operationally, uh, you're going to see those same kind of problems uh, from an IT perspective. Um, I think there's also an awareness now that some of the low-hanging cost savings uh, that IT has brought are probably exhausted. So the, la the larger savings for us, and I think everybody is aware, is that it hinges on uh, 
bigger things, process standardization, care standards, IT standards. So I think we all are realizing that just bringing together some technologies isn't really going to cut it. So I just want to share with you um, some of the challenges that we've found uh, as we started uh, doing all of our M&A activity. Um, Culture is a big one. Uh, how do you respect the culture that's there but find ways to combine them? I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard, especially for standalone hospitals who have come into this, to understand that they're no longer a singleton. Uh, they're now, they have siblings. And um, they don't really understand sometimes how shared resources work. So uh, that's always a, an interesting conversation to have for probably the first year. Um, Every organization that comes in has varying capabilities and, and they've kept things up differently. Um, so again, how do you how do you get them to the point where they meet the same brand promise um, from an organizational perspective? Um, Past relationships are a big one for organizations. You know, they might have been huge competitors prior to joining the uh, the organization. It, you have to now change your mindset as to how you work together. Um, superiority. Um, who's the big dog now? Um, I think it's really interesting, uh, especially when it's all relative as to size and reputation. And then for the organizations, I think the other thing that takes a little bit of a hit is their speed and autonomy, especially if they had been single organizations. It's easier to move fast and they don't have to ask anybody about what the combined strategy is. So I think it's harder for them sometimes to slow down a little bit and say, oh, we're part of a bigger picture. Specifically from an IT perspective, um, new vendors, getting to know them, um, and then speaking to them in a way, you know, how do you let people down gently uh, as to, you know, are they going to be staying, not staying? New technologies, how do they work? Um, they're all different. Uh, asset depreciation. Uh, you know, we've all spent a lot of money, especially over the last probably four years, given meaningful use ICD-10. If you haven't depreciated everything, when do you pull the plug? Is it now? Do you wait? Um, is keeping it in place going to cost you more than taking it out? Um, the redundant vendor contracts, like I said, Microsoft is a big one. Uh, those things can't be assigned. Um, you have to let them run out. And then um, varying skills. There's priorities, there's capabilities. Cybersecurity, like I mentioned earlier, has always been a, a big one. Um, and what do you have to do and how fast can you fill the gap? Uh, I just wanted to share this slide with you because uh, at Atlantic Health, it isn't just working through M&A. Uh, we are also a part of a consortium of non-merged organizations. So while we're trying to do this with the organizations that we're we're actually acquiring or merging with, we're doing some very similar things with organizations that we're not uh, merged with. So the goal of this organization, Allspire, Allspire is a conglomeration of the organizations that you see underneath. It's three uh, hospitals in New Jersey and four hospitals in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, altogether, uh, five different EMRs um, and with the goal of economies of scale, same thing, uh, IT looking at um, an IT GPO, looking at uh, data centers, looking at space. Um, but then the other goals are improving population health, improving standards of care, um, and creating a bigger, uh, broader GPO uh, for uh, pricing and economies of scale, as I mentioned. So that one is just another, and that's a little more interesting because now there really isn't um, any kind of, there's no stick there to make people do this. This is all, um, this is all by volunteerism. And so uh, it's just one more job that we've added. We also have two other um, types of affiliation. They're not a merger or an acquisition. Um, we have something with 100 in healthcare, which is, um, uh, it's it's called it's pretty much joint projects. It, my my boss calls it dating. Um, and what we do with them is while we're not uh, technically merged or affiliated, we are doing many many joint projects. And then we have another uh, organization in the area who um, has moved their data center into our data center. So we've got just uh, many many ways of working together with other organizations. So um, as we look to the future, um, these are just some of the next steps from an Atlantic perspective. Um, what we've done over the last six to seven years, especially from an M&A perspective, is that we identified the parts that we wanted to put into this uh, over the first three years. 
the last three years have been spent aggregating all those parts um, and and putting them together loosely. And now, uh, as we move into uh, you know our next decision, uh, especially where we are going with our HIS and some of the other things, it's really integrating those parts into really forming a, a very robust uh, integrated delivery network. Um, so again, here you see the standardization is a big one, um, getting ready for our HIS um, review, uh, working towards the standardization. Um, and then I think the big one, though, is remembering the basics. We're so busy every day doing the, all these other things, we still have uh, uh, trains to run and uh, keep on time. Uh, you know, it, it's very hard uh, when you take over other organizations and, you know, from my perspective, uh, my team's been very lucky because we've always been the the, the acquirer, uh, not being uh, not the ones being acquired. So what we've always tried to do is make sure that um, everyone is aware of the difficulties that that can cause for people. Um, so uh, again, the perspective is relative. Um, Every, every transaction is unique. Um, remember the people. Always remember the people. Um, they're important. And um, it's going to change their lives. Um, we have to always remember to celebrate the pride that those people have in their past and in what they've done. Um, then it's also important for us to paint the, pu the picture of how we're going together into the future. Um, respect what everybody's done. Uh, everybody's had wins and losses. Uh, I think we've all lived that. Watch what you say. Uh, take the best ideas regardless of where they've come from. Um, this is the one that just always stands out for me, though. The easier it looks, the worse it will always be. Um, it's just, it always happens. And just at the very end, um, just be kind and inclusive. Um, it's always a difficult thing, and I think um, if you do it with kindness um, and respect, uh, I think you always get a better outcome. Um, so those are my comments for today. Anthony, I'll just pass that back to you. Well, thank you so much, Linda. Great presentation, and uh, definitely looking forward to our Q&A. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over. We're going to hear from our sponsor, represented by uh, Lara Smith, Program Director for Health Information Exchange with Relay Health. Lara? Thanks, Anthony. Um, so today I'll be talking about connecting growing communities from a technology perspective. And as you acquire new hospitals and practices, not every entity is going to be on the same system. Um, some may never. Some may have a transition period. And you'll have to face um, the decision on how you connect these different disparate systems together. Um, from a connecting perspective, you know, the reason why it's, it's important is uh, to really support uh, better care coordination and improve the end-to-end -end experience for patients. It's very important to provide the right information at the right time. Um, this helps improve outcomes. Um, and it also helps support uh, a consistent experience for patients as well as your clinicians, which increases brand awareness. Now, although it sounds nice and great, th this is actually very complicated to um, connect these disparate systems together. Um, and Relay Health has actually been working with many of our customers and supporting them throughout the last 15 years and successfully connecting their disparate systems um, we've connected over 225 different vendor systems um, throughout our health system network in order to really acquire data and aggregate that data into a single view uh, for patients as well as clinicians to view. Now, our experience has really taught us a lot of lessons. Um, as well as we see a lot of challenges inherent to connecting uh, the disparate systems together. Um, so we wanted to share a little bit of the, the inherent challenges as well as give you some best practices. So some of the common challenges that we see across the board is terminology mapping. A lot of the different systems are not using the same data dictionaries. Um, so we're having to work with uh, many of the different systems, understanding their technology and their terminology, and then aggregating that into one view. Across the board, I think it is, as an industry, we also struggle with patient identity management. So we work on resolving that patient identity. There's also a challenge on uh, multiple version management and resource capacity with meaningful use in ICD-9 may be hard to get some of the resources. 
So we put together three best practices that you can take away with when you are thinking about connecting and growing your organization. So the first best practice is really around assessing your landscape and prioritizing uh, the projects that will allow you to connect and impact uh, the, the, the most um, at first. And then also identify the systems and work on those projects first so that you can do those in batches. We've actually started doing this. and We've found that our customers can now see time to value within a few weeks versus a few months. We've also found a best practice on defining objectives um, and setting the desired outcomes up front. That helps the team's focus. And it also helps the, the vendors customize the design test plans and timelines, and then it helps you measure the success. And lastly, consider your resources. Initiate discussions up front with your vendors um, and request that the same resources work on uh, the projects. And we've started doing this at Relay Health, and we've found that that is extremely valuable for our customers because they're no longer feeling like the first time we work on a project is the first time. Um, and aligning your resources up front will reduce any potential fault starts or delays. And with that, um, I'll just uh, thank everyone for giving us the time to sponsor this event. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Here's my email, and I'll pass it back to you, Anthony. Very good. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much, Lara. Appreciate it, and we certainly appreciate your sponsorship of the event. So with that, we're ready for our Q&A. Uh, as I mentioned, go ahead, type your question in and send it in the Q&A box. Leave the default set to all panelists. So first question, Linda, um, do you have a team that focuses on change management slash communication, not so much related to the IT changes, but all the processes that are impacted? Yes, we do. Um, absolutely, we do. And uh, IT is one of the teams that sits on that um, committee. It, it's um, it's pretty much an organizational integration steering committee, and uh, they have on there some of the key functions. So HR sits on there, internal communication sits on there, and it's um, managed by our Six Sigma uh, process improvement team um, and our, our VP of um, uh, HR and process improvement. So um, we do have a chair for that, and then so and then you have uh, so IT is a member of that, finance is a member of that. Um, so we have all the right teams that sit on that, and then uh, but it is managed by uh, Six Sigma. Very good. You mentioned that a, a lot of information can't be shared beforehand uh, before uh -huh. the merger and has to be done afterwards. Um, without giving away uh, anything you don't want to give away, you recall anything extreme that, that came out afterwards that you said, oh, my God, look at this? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I say some of the big, some of the contracts, mm -hmm. I think, are, are really the, uh, some of them because we couldn't share them ahead of time. You knew that there, you knew that you had this vendor, but you didn't understand what the, um, the details of the contract were. And it was just, um, especially an IT outsourcing contract, it was just unbelievable. Um, it, it, we had to actually pay to get out of it. Um, so that, you know, so sometimes that those kind of things will um, will get you because you just can't see them ahead of time. So one of those uh, Panama Canal type 100-year things. Yep, exactly. <laughs> And, um, and not only that, you know, it was an escalating. It was an escalating contract. So, if we removed anything from the contract, the price didn't go down. But if you added anything, the price went up. Um, so you're saying, so, you're saying, why did you guys sign this? Right, exactly. That's part of it. It's like, who who approved this? Did somebody approve this? Um, so you know, those, those are the kind of things that get you. And then you know, because it was they had just renewed it. Um, it was interesting too because. Um, we were having these conversations, and they renewed that contract um, just six months before they, we actually merged. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff that's kind of happening. There's all this stuff that's kind of in flight in the background that seems to have a life of its own that you don't find out until it's a little too late. And there's nothing to be done about it, right? It's right. just the way it is. Right. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned the, the idea of uh, – so, so you make an, an acquisition – um, I would imagine, you know, most of the time, the majority of the time, you are 
going to be lifting up that entity in one way or another. You're the acquirer, theoretically. You're bringing right. something to them. You know, usually, right. Of course, it goes both ways. But in general, you're going to be lifting them up in some way. Is it something to think about not to slap your brand right away on the acquired entity? Because you did touch on the idea of bringing them up to speed sort of for a consistent experience throughout the branded entities. So right away, do you want to slap Atlantic Health on a place when you get in there and you go, not quite Atlantic Health ready yet, going to need a little time? Um, yes, and they they do that. Um I think we, you know, very right after the signing, we start really looking at some of those quality processes. Going into this, you have a pretty good idea of what somebody's reputation is in the community, um, and kind of, you know, it, it's everybody talks, <clears throat> so you have a good idea of what's out there, maybe what needs to be brought up to snuff. Um, you know, I think it's very hard to not put your brand on an organization right when you close, because that may, it's the culture thing, right? Because now you want to bring all these people in and you want them to be you know feel part of the company and the organization so I think you're right I think it, I think it's a very um, it's a fine line as to where you're going to do that but I think you know you have to take you have to weigh which one's more important um, for you at, at the time you mentioned uh, you know the vendor stuff must be huge uh, you know you have duplicate dupli duplicative things you both have the same thing you have different things you have contracts that you would like to address or at least discuss with the vendor mm -hmm. um, I would imagine there's a huge amount of CIO interaction with the the chief um, or, or your head of whatever was the title is the head lawyer for your health system yes um, so talk about maybe some best practices in working with that individual that other CIOs may be able to uh, to follow mm -hmm. well it's interesting because um the our chief um, legal officer and I we do we had to talk a lot because um, of what and it kind of is before the signing right because what do you want to look at what do you make what do you want to make sure that you're going to cover uh, we have one entity that we're working with now and uh, like I said I think I mentioned that the organization that's selling them to us is from out of state and they're going to be moving out of state where does that where does the meaningful use money belong. Right? Does that stay with the local entity, or does it go with the corporate entity that's leaving? So I think there's just a lot of those things. What happens if they get audited later and the, they come back to take back the meaningful use money? Uh, what happens if they don't meet some of the HIPAA requirements? Um, what happens um, if there, a breach is discovered that might be uh, you know, a certain number of years old? So I think there's just a lot of those things from a legal perspective that you sit down and talk about um, as to how do you, you know, maybe Maybe, uh, mitigate some of the risks that might be coming at you. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the meaningful use issue. Uh, you, you require, let's say, you acquire an entity that has attested uh, and received monies. I would imagine you can't. There's no way beforehand to find out what their documentation consists of. There's a lot of audits going on. So right. is that something you look at right after the right as soon as you can get in there and say, are you is this place in good shape for an audit of the money yep. they've received? Yes, actually, we work with a third-party auditor, a meaningful use auditor, um, and some of the work that they do is to help us take a look at that, look at the documentation. Um, and so we actually were able to proactively say, okay, here's some documentation that has to be there. Um, so working with a company like that was very helpful for us um, because they took a look at not only just what we have, but also what we need to have in place to make sure that going forward. Um, the other one that we did, um, we do it for every single uh, acquisition, is we bring in our, uh, out, you know, our third party security vendor. Um, and one of the very first things we do is a security audit. Because, and then we take a look at the gaps, you know, how close or how far is this entity from our security standards and how much work um, are we going to have to put into that? Um, because that might change, you know, depending on some of that, that might change the price, right? Or it might change something. There might be something that they have to uh, give back. So it's very, and it's also a very different perspective if the organization is a standalone. So if it's a standalone and they attest it for meaningful use and then they come back and there's an audit and there's a problem, there's really nobody to go back to. But if you're working with somebody that, you know, uh, uh, like another organization that sold you that entity, there might be there might be some recourse. So mm -hmm. I, that's what I mean. That's why they're all different. Just as a last question, let's talk a little bit about the people issue. 
Um, you know, we all know that there's a shortage of great IT folks, especially when you get into the, some of the more niche areas where, you know, someone can just be worth their weight in gold because of what they can do and what they know. Um, so you're acquiring an organization, and you could have some real gems, some real yep. uh, mm -hmm. gems in that IT yes, shop. Right. So you don't want to let them slip away because you haven't communicated correctly and they're just in fear for their jobs and they figure, listen, I've got some opportunity over here. These people aren't telling me what's going on, so I'm gone. So it, it, there's a degree of speed, I would imagine, and, but talk more about the process of getting in there mm -hmm. and seeing what you have from the people side and making sure you hold on to the folks you really should. Well, one of the first things that we we often do is um, I get in there as soon as I can and introduce myself to everybody, um, talk a little bit about you know how how we're looking forward to to working with them, um, and then very shortly after that we always do we try and do a meet and greet. So um, you know we'll bring the organization in, we'll have you know a little three or four hour um, you know just. Uh, you know, just a party, a little, you know, food or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and that lets them meet everybody else who's in the department. So I think from that perspective, it just gets them, it gives them a little, uh, I guess, security blanket that, you know, there's other people that are here and they're happy. Um, you know, this is not a big, horrible place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it it gets them, uh, you know, a little more comfortable. And then, you know, as our other directors get, my other directors get in there and uh, they also talk to the different teams, we do a, a presentation of who's on what teams um, so they can see the faces. Um, so I think those are the kind of things you can do early. And the meet and greet thing is something that we've done even before the signing has been done a number of times. So and we've, you know, we've done, yeah, we've done little, little just little presentations as who, this is who we are as a department. Uh, these are the systems that we run. It really is just a sharing of information. Well, that's great. Um, that's about all we had time for today, Linda. I want to thank you so much for joining us. The great presentation and the good advice. Uh, as you said, there's a lot of M&A going on out there, so I think this is going to be very valuable to your colleagues. So I appreciate it. I also thank want you. to uh, thank uh, Lara Smith and Relay Health for sponsoring the event, making it possible. As I mentioned, you will get an email when the archive is ready. For those of you that have the Chime CHCIO certification, if you've asked us to communicate your attendance to Chime, we'll do that. If you have not, go ahead and, and do that uh, on your own. Each, uh, each of our webinars gets you one CEU if you attend. Questions, comments, please email me and go to our website to view our upcoming schedule and our last 12 months of archives. So with that, I want to again thank Linda and Lara and our attendees. Everybody have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you.